picture of the Stovall airplane in our fixture in Fort Worth going through its static testing. It was the first to complete that. Our CTOL or Air Force version of the airplane completed similar testing at the BAE facility in Brough, England. Both of those airplanes have now completely finished their static testing. And we started the fatigue testing on the CTOL variant of the airplane about a month ago. What's uh, significant about that is that this is how we open the structural envelope for flight tests. Historically, we've incrementally done the static testing as we've been doing flight testing, and we've slowly opened the flight envelope. But today, both of these versions of the airplane have a full structural envelope available to the pilots to work in, assuming the other limitations on the systems and stuff are, are going to meet the structural limits. So very important to get that done early. One of the concerns that uh, folks have had on the program is concurrency, which is the overlap of development and production. This is a very much a risk reduction that we reduce the risk of having structural retrofits later on for airplanes that have already been built. So two of the three airplanes have completed this. If you would go ahead. The third airplane, the Navy jet, uh, actually had to go through some other unique testing for Navy airplanes. And if you haven't seen this before, I thought it might be interesting for you. This is the airplane. And it's going through drop testing at the Vought facility in Grand Prairie, Texas. This particular uh, configuration is a full external load at maximum trap rate. To set the picture up before I turn the movie on, we spin the tires up to uh, projected landing speed, about 135 knots. We raise the airplane up and we drop it. And we simulate the impact of landing on a ship, or, uh, an aircraft carrier. So one of the unique things about this version of the airplane is the landing gear is considerably beefier than the other two because it's, it's designed to withstand these kind of impact loadings. You also notice that there's two nose tires on the Navy airplane, only one on the other two. That's in the event of a uh, tire blowout on a cat stroke. You still got another tire to get you off the ship with. So we'll turn this video on, and you can see what this testing looks like. It's it's one of those ones that only engineers can come up with this. these tests uh, rather successfully. This was the, we're told this is the first Navy airplane in recorded structural testing that's not had any changes to the landing gear and completed that testing. Um, historically, there's some metering changes or valve changes required to get the right kind of impact loading on those tests. So again, another positive structural test for us. This airplane, this same airplane now, will go into the static testing that the other two have recently completed. And we were not anticipating issues with the Navy jet because we had good success on the other two, but we'll go through that complete test on that airplane also. Okay, next. If you're sitting in the cockpit, this is what it more or less looks like. Um, what, you're what you're seeing up here is what's now displayed on the pilot's helmet. You know, on older airplanes, it's displayed on the HUD, a head-up display. So that's actually on your helmet. And this is what your, your panel looks like where you display your sensor information. In. I've got two sensor tapes that I want to show you. These are taken from the Catbird. This is our distributed aperture system flying through the hills of Southern California, and you can see it's near photographic level quality. This is an infrared system, so it's day or night, it doesn't matter, it's just sensing temperature differences. These cameras are positioned around the airplane, and we were able to knit their images together through software and display it on the pilot's helmet so he can actually look through the cameras as he's flying. The second sensor is the electro-optical targeting system to set this up, this is the parking lot. This is the, the meteor crater in Arizona visitor center. There's people walking here. There's a guy out here who's uh, raking the yard. You can see the glint off of the rake. Um, so again, very, very fine definition from a delta T or temperature differential. This is all in the infrared spectrum. The shadows you see up here are places where cars were parked in the parking lot that have left. But the concrete hasn't warmed up uniformly yet. Okay, so again, very, very high definition, the high quality sensor work is now, we're now getting real data off the catbird. Our first uh, mission system sensors are now flying in both the Stovall and Seacall airplanes. Uh, we're flying integrated uh, sensors on that. The third major sensor on the airplane is the radar. This is Northrop Grumman radar, next generation beyond the F-22. Here's a picture taken from a satellite camera in space through Google Earth. This is the same shot. This is actually our facility in Fort Worth. Our factory is located here. This is the field at, at the old Carswell Air Force Base. 
So you can see what it looks like from a distance now. On this radar, we can actually zoom in and get some more detail. Again, comparing it to the photograph there, you see the level of detail we're now able to get through the weather uh, with a radar type uh, sensor. We can go even further than that and get down to some specific um, areas that we're looking into a runway or looking for vehicles parked in a certain area. And we can even go one more if we need to. So, so from, a, from a radar capability perspective, again, this is a new, new generation of capability. What we do is we fuse this data with the infrared data that I showed you a minute ago with the electronic warfare data coming from other sensors. And the pilot now has a three degree, 360 degree view of the world of what's going on around it. So again, delivering on the revolutionary sensor capability that, that has been forecasted for the program. Where are we spending our time now? A lot of our time right now is focused on the global supply chain. I mentioned that we're not just recapitalizing the multi-role fighter force, we're also recapitalizing the defense industry around the world. So we have three pieces of that. The first is taking a global supply chain up the curve to build the airplane at high production rates, up to one a day, <coughs> we'll project them in the future. If you think about it, every time one of those airplanes rolls out the door, it flies somewhere in the world and lands in an operational environment. So at the same time, we're putting in a global sustainment environment. And in between the both of those, there is any number of things that can go wrong and slow you down, such things as export licenses, taxes and tariffs, uh, free trade control zones, things like that. And so our global delivery system team is working to make sure we understand that. This team also is comprised of membership from all the partner countries looking at the different border issues that, that exist in a multinational program like this. So 